all the things that entangle us, as they say. Cords up here everywhere. Good morning. They will read from John 3, verses 3 through 21 from the message. Jesus said, you're absolutely right. Take it from me. Unless a person is born from above, it's not possible to see what I'm pointing to, to God's kingdom. How can anyone, asked, said Nicodemus, be born who has already been born and grow up? You can't re-enter your mother's womb and be born again. What are you saying with this born from above talk? Jesus said, you're not listening. Let me say it again. Unless a person submits to this original creation, the wind hovering over the water creation, the invisible moving the visible, a baptism into new life, it's not possible to enter God's kingdom. When you look at a baby, it's just that, a body you can look at and touch. But the person who takes shape within is formed by something you can't see and touch, the spirit, and becomes a living spirit. So don't be surprised when I tell you that you have to be born from above, out of this world, so to speak. You know well enough how the wind blows this way and that. You hear it rustling through the trees, but you have no idea where it comes from or where it's headed next. That's the way it is with everyone born from above by the wind of God, the Spirit of God. Nicodemus asked, what do you mean by this? How does this happen? Jesus said, you're a respected teacher of Israel, and yet you don't understand these basics? I give witness only to what I have seen with my own eyes. I'm speaking sober truth to you. I speak only of what I know by experience. There is nothing secondhand here, no hearsay. Yet instead of facing the evidence and accepting it, you procrastinate with questions. If I tell you things that are plain as the hand before your face and you don't believe me, what use is there in telling you of things you can't see, the things of God? No one has ever gone up into the presence of God except the one who came down from that presence, the Son of Man. In the same way that Moses lifted the serpent in the desert so people could have something to see and then believe, it is necessary for the Son of Man to be lifted up, and everyone who looks up to him, trusting and expectant, will gain a real life, eternal life. This is how much God loved the world. He gave his Son, his one and only Son. And this is why, so that no one need be destroyed. By believing in him, anyone can have a whole and lasting life. God didn't go to all the trouble of, of sending his son merely to point an accusing finger telling the world how bad it was. He came to help, to put the world right again. Anyone who trusts in him is acquitted. Anyone who refuses to trust him has long since been under the death sentence without knowing it. And why? Because of that person's failure to believe in the one-of-a-kind Son of God when introduced to him. This is the crisis we're in. God light streamed into the world, but men and women everywhere ran for the darkness. They went for the darkness because they were not really interested in pleasing God. Everyone who makes a practice of doing evil, addicted to denial and illusion, hates God light and won't come near it, fearing a painful exposure. But anyone working and living in truth and reality welcomes God light so the work can be seen for the God work it is. How about now? Okay, I must have had a bad connection. Okay, I'm not blasting you out too bad though, right? Still hear me? Okay, let's start in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for you are worthy of all glory and praise and honor. Lord, as we approach this time of thanksgiving, Lord, help us to consider the things that we should be thankful for. So much things that you give us every single day, blessing upon blessing upon blessing, grace upon grace upon grace. 
that we don't realize that we take for granted, Lord, and we complain and grumble. Lord, help us our, our hearts to be focused on praise and adoration for you. The fact that you would love us enough to create us in your image and that you would redeem us back by the precious blood of your, your son, Father. That you would call us your children and empower us by your spirit to live a life that is not our own, but a life that is empowered by the Holy Spirit to be the holy people set apart for your service. Help us to realize that today, Lord. Open our ears to hear what the Spirit has to say to the church, Lord. Apply it to our lives. Help us not only to live a life of faith, but to live a life of worth, producing the fruit that you have called us to produce. Help Jesus to continue to root around and to dig and, and, and prune where necessary, Lord, so that we will be the fruit-bearing people that we should be. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I've entitled this, you can't see it up there, but it's the kingdom of God, because we're going to talk about that today. Before we do, I want you to think a little bit. There's some things that we mention all the time um, in talking, and what do those really mean? What does it mean to be born again? That's why I started this in John chapter 3, so that you'll realize that you're a created being, but if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, if you had that repentance in your mind that caused you to change the way that you think, which changed your heart, it calls you to action. You cannot be the same. Are you born from above? Are you a new creation in Jesus Christ? Have you come out of the darkness into the light? Nicodemus was, was wise in Scripture, a religious leader of his day, but yet he did not want to come out of the darkness. He didn't want to repent and change his way of thinking. He realized he came to Jesus because he saw the mighty miracles he did. And he said, we know that you're from God. But could he repent and believe that Jesus Christ was the Messiah, the chosen one? And would he live his life in allegiance to following his king? So what is the kingdom of God? That's the next thing I want you to think about. We talk about that and it's hard for us to even comprehend kings and kingdoms in our democracy, so to speak, and everything. And we are focused, whether we want to admit it or not, on materialism and comfort and things like that in this world. It's hard to, to pick up where Jesus tells us that he's called us to suffer, that he was a suffering servant, that he patterned us to give up our lives, to live a life of self-denial, live a life of suffering. And with that suffering, we become patient in our in our. Uh, Faith grows in everything. And we left off last week, a few verses back in Luke 12, 49, Jesus said, I have come to ignite a fire on earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. That's the answer that Jesus came for why he said he came to earth. He came to earth to ignite a fire. Has the Holy Spirit come upon you has the flame been ignited, and is it burning brightly? Is it raging? Are we coming together with one another and building that flame up even more? Are we living like Christ in this world? Do others see our good deeds and glorify our Father who art in heaven? Do we spend time in praise and thanksgiving, rather than being complacent or rather than, or rather than grumbling? Have you think about those words that Jesus says last week at all? Did you think about that fire and how it's ignited in your life? Let me remind you how Jesus started his public ministry in the, in the Gospel of Luke. He took the scroll of Isaiah, it was handed to him, and he deliberately found this passage. It says that he turned to it. That's in Luke, 14, Luke chapter 4, verse 17. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because He has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, I don't know when we read that, but that was back in maybe January or February, because I started out with being at the dinner table with Luke this year and then went backwards to Luke chapter 4. I didn't really cover the first few chapters but I started with a temptation and then Jesus is coming into public ministry. And as we read along, we read the, the Sermon on the Plain and we learn more about what it means to, to be blessed because we're poor in spirit and so forth. The Spirit of the Lord is on me. Is the Spirit of the Lord on you? Is He guiding you into all truth as you read God's Word, as you pray, as you pattern your lives after Jesus? Because He has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. You've been anointed. You've been set apart. You're a saint, not an ain't. You are holy. 
Faith for God's service, you should be different than this world. And you should be preaching good news to those who are poor in spirit. Those who realize they've repented and realize that there's no way they can pay their sin debt to God. That they are bankrupt when it comes to spiritual things. They might think they're rich in this world, but they realize, if you've been reading your devotions, that you're naked and blind and poor and you need to buy salve from Jesus for it to, to, to see clearly. And you need to, to lean upon Him for riches and understanding. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind to release the oppressed. And we're going to get into the word. Jesus actually does this in a synagogue in, in Luke chapter 13. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, because we are living in a time that today is the day of your salvation. We're living in God's favor, and we saw that from the parable of the fig tree in the, in the vineyard. That Jesus said, please give me a little more time so that they'll produce fruit. Because judgment is coming and the owner is going to cut down that tree that does not bear fruit and throw it into the fire. Do you understand that? Has Jesus ignited a holy fire in your life? Do you care about those who are held captive by Satan's power and the power of sin in their lives? Do you care enough to, live, to give up your life, your desires to live out for the kingdom? Or is that still something that scares you because you're afraid that if you just say, yes, Lord, use me, He'll send you to some foreign mission field or whatever it is, and you're afraid of that? Or you think you're not equipped, but we're all equipped with the power of God. We have an unlimited bank account for the Holy Spirit. Jesus taught us already in the Scriptures we read that if we keep knocking, we keep seeking, we keep asking, what good Father would not give good gifts? And how much more will your Heavenly Father not give you the Holy Spirit so that you can be like Jesus? Because if you've answered His call and come out of the world to follow Him, He should be making you into a fisher of men. Do you realize this is what a Christian is to do? Are you a Christian? And are you living the abundant Christian life? As a shepherd, that is the burden that I carry. That whoever I talk to, especially those that come weekly and a part of this family member, is do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord? Because there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth by many that thought they knew Him and did not. And then are you living your life to the fullest or is there any things entangling you, any sins that you need to let go of, anything else so that you live an abundant life for Jesus Christ? Because you only have one life to live and you do not know when your life will be required of you. Be rich to God rather than foolish. <clears throat> this is the year of the Lord's favor. So repent. Jesus told that to His actual disciples or you will also perish. Do you understand that if seed has been planted by anyone, that whoever plants those seeds expects a harvest? That is the reason that the seed was planted. And if God has planted you in His vineyard, there will be celebration, but there will also be weeping and gnashing of teeth because He will harvest and the chaff will be thrown away and burned in an unquenchable fire. So are you producing fruit? Can you produce more fruit? Are you producing fruit abundantly? Is the Spirit's flame burning brightly in your life? Last week, Sherry read from the Gospel of John in John 15, verse 8. She read, This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit. Not a little fruit, not a decent amount of fruit, but a lot of fruit. So the world sees that. So that you know for sure that you're being guided by the Spirit. That you're maturing. That you don't have to eat simply eat milk anymore. That you're, you're eating meat. Proving yourselves to be my disciples. That there's no doubt that you belong to the kingdom. And that others see that and are drawn to the light. Jesus did not hide. The light was clearly put out on a table for all to see. Is there any ways in your life that you're hiding the light of Jesus Christ or is it shining brightly? Is there proof in your life that you are a disciple of Christ? Because if there's not today, you need to repent before you face Jesus face to face. Because when He comes back, He will come back as a thief in the night. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. He will surprise many who thought they were ready. And there will be joyous celebrations for those who are ready and go into the banquet with Him. Luke 13, verse 10. 
One Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in the synagogues, and a woman there had been disabled by a spirit for 18 years. She was hunched over and could not stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called over and said, Woman, you are set free from your disability. Then he placed his... I got a cough drop that just collapsed. Hold on a minute. It was in the corner of my mouth, and it just collapsed all over. Okay. Then he placed his hands on her, and immediately she straightened up and began to glorify God. But the synagogue leader was indignant that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. There are six days for work, he told the crowd, so come and be healed on those days and not on the Sabbath. You hypocrites, the Lord replied. Does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or donkey from the stall and lead it to water? Then should not this daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for 18 years, be released from her bondage on the Sabbath day? When Jesus said this, all of his adversaries were humiliated, and the whole crowd rejoiced at all the glorious things he was doing. Now, if you remember back again, and I wish we could just go straight through every day through Luke's gospel so we didn't have a week in there that we had a break or anything. Jesus started his ministry teaching in the synagogues where he unrolled the scroll, you know, and, and he did things. He, he continued to do that. And there continued to be controversy on the Sabbath, whether he was in the synagogue or out in the wheat fields, because he did things on the Sabbath. And the, the religious leader said, you're the hypocrite. You're doing things on the Sabbath, and we're not supposed to do anything on the Sabbath. We're supposed to keep it holy. But what other better way to keep it holy than do the works of the kingdom of God? to help those who are oppressed, to set the captives free, to preach the gospel message, to do good things. So we should keep a Sabbath day and make it holy by doing God's work on that day, especially rather than doing our work for our dreams, our desires, everything else, or just because we've got to have a job and so forth. What better day to set someone free from the bondage of Satan that she has been in for 18 years? If you understand Jesus is in his last six, six months of ministry, this is the last time we'll see him preaching in a synagogue also. And we also learn as he's done this already that the Pharisees and the teachers of the laws and the Sadducees had already reached the point where they needed to get rid of him because he continued to do these things on the Sabbath and he proclaimed that he was God. They didn't care about the good things that Jesus did. They cared about that he was a blaspheming but Jesus said, if you cannot understand this, I perform miracles by the finger of God. Who do yours do it by then? But they were so blinded, so hard in their heart that they wouldn't repent, repent. And they couldn't even acknowledge that a woman was healed from the powers of Satan on the Sabbath day. The crowds realized it. But the leader, we'll call him the pastor of that church, the leader of that synagogue did not see that. <clears throat> so let's break it down a little bit. And I'm going to preach this passage um, with the parables coming up probably in a different way than you've been taught. And you can think about that if you want to. And you can stay with the way that you've been taught or you can follow my way or you can take them both or whatever. But I'm just going to warn you before I do that you're like, what's he preaching? Okay, and I'll, I'll explain it more in a minute. One Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues and a woman there had been disabled by a spirit for 18 years. We don't know why she came to church that day. We don't know if she came for healing. We don't know if she just came to church. We don't know that she had the faith for the miracle, but we know she had faith because Jesus says she's a daughter of Abraham. She came there. She didn't ask Jesus to help her or anything else. She came to church that day. Maybe she expected like when Jesus came off the mountain, the people that brought their, uh, the man that brought his son to the disciples, he, they, he expected them to cast out the demon. They couldn't. Because they didn't have the faith, they didn't do the prayer behind it. And Jesus was indignant with them, but they could not do that. We don't know why she was there that day, but she was there that day, and she was disabled by a spirit, not just a deformity, not just a disease, but this was a disease related, uh, related to demonic presence in her life. Now, that doesn't mean all diseases like this are or anything else. But we're clear in this case, Luke describes it for us, that this is a demonic problem. And this demonic problem is then seen in the way that she is bent double, is what the Greek word says in her disability. Bent in half. There's a medical term for it, and I'm not going to try to describe it there. But it's a rare thing where you literally are bent in two, and you can't do anything but look at the ground. What kind of 
pain she had, must have been in. And how could you look at her and not have some kind of compassion? You see an animal, and we'll get to that in a minute, and you see an animal limping around needing something to eat. Oh, and you have compassion on that animal. But you don't have compassion on this human being, this daughter of Abraham, because it's the Sabbath day and we shouldn't work because holy we are. Wow. So many times, especially as leaders in the church, we need to be careful that we're not teaching hypocrisy, that we don't think we're higher or mightier than we are, but we teach God's Word with clarity. And that's why I'm going to emphasize this a little bit further. Jesus sees her and has compassion on her and calls to her. Verse 12, When Jesus saw her, He called her over and said, Woman, you are set free. You are loosed. Let me remind you of the words of Isaiah again. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because He has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of the sight to the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That's how Jesus started in the synagogue when He deliberately read those words of Isaiah. And this is the last time we have recorded that Jesus is in a synagogue and He is doing exactly what He said that He was going to do. What further proof do you need that Jesus is doing exactly what He said and that all Scripture points to Jesus? It's not just an infirmity. It's a demonic hold, and Jesus loosed the captivity that she was in. He brought her liberty, and He did it in a synagogue on a Sabbath day, but the religious leader that was in charge there was indignant about what He did. Verse 13, Then He placed His hands on her and immediately she straightened up and began to glorify God. She knew where the healing came from. She didn't come necessarily seeking it, anything else, but she was healed and Jesus actually, which He didn't do in some miracles, some miracles He did, reached out and touched her. Had the physical touch of Jesus showing His compassion, showing how much He cares. And you've all been touched by Jesus Christ if you have had the Holy Spirit come to you, you've repented, and you've been born again. You are part of the kingdom of God. So are you living like you are? What a wonderful thing that happened in church that day. But the leader of the church did not think so. Verse 14, But the synagogue leader was indignant that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. And he said, there are six days for work, he told the crowd. He didn't say that to Jesus. He told it to the crowd. He accused them of coming to church not to glorify God, but to have their problems fixed. I wonder how many times that people come to church today because it's either a socialization place or my kids behave a little better when I come to church or I just need some of that good stuff in my life to offset the bad stuff. We come here to worship God, to get prepared by the God's Word to go out in the battlefield to serve Him, to get the nourishment we need on Sunday. And I pray and pray and pray that you're nourishing yourself as much as this, if not more every day, because this is what? An hour or two each, day, uh, each Sunday, each week. You try to do that little bit in physical nourishment and see if you do not starve to death. You surely won't be functioning the way you should function. Now, are you ready to face that spiritual battle? Are you nourishing off the bread of life and living water? Are you born again and are you living your life to show proof by the way you live that you're a child of the kingdom of God? <clears throat> There are six days for work, he told the crowd, so come and be healed on those days and not on the Sabbath. Wow. Question here is, how do you interpret God's laws? I mean, this is a religious leader. The people looked up to him. He led that church. Was he blind leading the blind? Maybe in some cases. some cases he may have been preaching the two, truth, but where was his heart? Was it focused on living for God and living for God through Jesus now that He came face to face with Jesus? Let Jesus be the Lord of His life. Because if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, you will be saved. Are you living God's laws? And I don't mean just to the letter where I say, okay, I'm not going to steal, but yet I have animosity in my heart for this person down here. 
Go back and read the Sermon on the Plain. Read the Sermon on the Mount and see how Jesus expanded on the truths that we want to think I'm living the law the way that I should. Even Paul said, I thought I was living the law the way that I should till I got to that part about not coveting the Tenth Commandment. You'll see how as you work through the commandments that you're progressing further and further and further away from God. And that part of coveting, why do we live our life for things? Why do we worry about things except that we covet those things? James says, why are there quarrels among you? Because you want what you can't have. You're jealous of other people and everything. I don't feel that way. Really? If your eyes are focused on Jesus and you're truly living out the royal law that is to love God and to love others as I love myself, then you won't have a problem with these things. You'll have swept your, your home free. And you won't have to worry about demonic activity coming back and invading it in bigger forces. Jesus said, you hypocrites. He didn't say you hypocrite to the, to the man alone. He said you hypocrites. To all those that's there, we don't know what reason they came there again. We, we don't know the reason the woman came there. But we know that she had enough faith and she glorified God when Jesus called her over because he had compassion and he set her free. So much we don't know about this story. But it is so beautiful. You hypocrites, the Lord replied, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his or her donkey from the stall and lead it to water? Because there's not hypocrisy only in the leader of the synagogue. There's hypocrisy all throughout the church. And don't we have enough compassion to feed and water our animal on that Sabbath day rather than letting them go without food or water that day? Of course we do. Do I care more about animals than I do human beings? I wouldn't like to think I do. But there is something wrong with our society. Just watch regular television. No, I don't because I don't want you filled with all the other garbage. <laughs> but how many advertisements you'll see, long advertisements for taking care of these animals because it's a time of compassion and caring in this holiday season and they want your money to feed animals while they kill your babies. And God forbid you put on a commercial that talks about killing the babies instead of killing the animals because, boy, then you would be... I don't know what would happen. Approximately 83,000 abortions will take place in the U.S. alone between Thanksgiving and Christmas. Can you imagine the uproar in the United States if we killed that many dogs and cats? That's all I'm going to say. The world estimate per year is 73 million abortions now. That's 200,000 a day. And we say we don't sacrifice our children to the gods of the Canaanites and Hittites and Sadducees. Most of those are because those births are inconvenient. Not for other reasons that we might justify or not justify. They're just an inconvenience on my life. I wasn't ready for this. I don't want this. And I don't want to think about it as murder, but let's think about what it is. God forms you in your mother's womb. And it's a terrible tragedy, and the only thing that I can think about is that God is sovereign in all of this. But where is our compassion? Where is our heart focused? How many dogs and cats and other animals will we feed and pass by the guy on the street and say, well, if you get off your butt and work, maybe he should. But how's the attitude in your heart? You untie or you loose an animal. What about your compassion on human beings? And especially if it's not how you read the law. <clears throat> Verse 16, Then should not this daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for 18 years, Jesus spells it out, Satan kept her bound. Shouldn't she be released from her bondage? And shouldn't it be on the Sabbath day of all days? Because he's Lord of the Sabbath. He came to set the captives free, to preach the good news. Will you believe rather than stay in your hypocrisy? When Jesus said this, all his adversaries were humiliated. We don't know who those were. We know it was a synagogue leader, unfortunately, but there were more adversaries there. 
And we know from reading back in Scripture and reading along in this orderly account so that you would know what you would believe if you truly are a disciple of Christ and you can come to Him at any point during this gospel, that they were ready to kill Him. And boy, were they ready to kill Him now and we're getting into His final months of His life. And the whole crowd, re whole crowd rejoiced at all the glorious things Jesus was doing. But would they come to Him? Would they consider the cost? Would they be willing to deny themselves and take up a cross and follow after Jesus? Or would, would they just say, well, we'll associate with Jesus while times are good? Will we cry out to Jesus even in times are bad? But will we give up our life and follow Him as a servant, as a dulios, as a slave? Because we know that our, pri our life was purchased we are, our life is not our own, that we've been given new life, that we're born again, empowered and driven by the Holy Spirit, by God's Word, by Jesus living through us. Is that what you believe? So I ask again, the kingdom of God, what does that phrase mean to you? What do you think about when you hear it? And I'm serious because you can think about all kinds of things and there's nothing wrong with that answer. But you should be thinking about God's kingdom and how you're living for it, regardless of what you come up with the definitions of that. And you've got to put in repent, because John the Baptist started his preaching that way, and Jesus started preaching that way. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. You've got to change the way you think and live. You've got to. And if you're going to be the light for your family, for your friends, if you're going to make a difference in this world, if you're going to produce fruit and produce much fruit, then you've got to keep changing. You've got to be careful in the way you're thinking. You've got to continue to be fed because it's easy to get away from that and get complacent and to go down another path and not see your hypocrisy till you're sitting there one day saying, you shouldn't heal on the Sabbath. But I'll untie my animal and feed him on the Sabbath. A simple explanation of the kingdom of God is, is or the ki a kingdom, and then we will apply it to God, is a land area that a king rules and reigns over. Right? And who is this king? God. All of creation is Him, but we have rebelled against Him. So if we belong to the kingdom of God, we recognize the area the, where we live, even though we're seated already in heavenly realms, we're still living it out here on earth, that we are a subject to the king, that we've pledged our allegiance for the king, that we live for the kingdom, not for ourselves. Our lives have to look different than the guy down the road that has the same job, goes does the same stores and everything else that does not know Jesus. If we do not look remarkably different, how are we ever going to be a light to him? especially if we're participating in some of the things that maybe we shouldn't be participating in, that he does. Peter tells us that's why they, they see us and are surprised that we don't do the things and ask us why, the hope that we have. So the next verse, then Jesus asked, what is the kingdom of light? God like, he asked that. Why did he ask this right after this teaching? I'll remind you again that Nicodemus came to Jesus in the dark because he knew that Jesus performed signs. He knew that he did it under the power of God. He knew that Jesus was at least a prophet, a great prophet. And Jesus told him, Truly, truly, I tell you, verily, verily, listen up. No one can see the kingdom of God unless he's born again. Okay, so I cannot understand the kingdom of God, and maybe that's why I have some miscomprehensions with it unless I'm born again. If I am born again, if I am truly born again, then I see the kingdom of God, I realize its realization, I realize my purpose to be the hands and feet of Jesus in this earth until He comes, and I live for the King of kings. Doesn't mean I have to sell everything and go to a foreign mission field, but if I'm not willing to do that, then I've got to look at that and say, why not? Is there something in my life that has a greater love than my love for the one who gave his life for me? Reading from the message again, unless a, portion, a person is born from above, it's not possible to see what I'm pointing to, to God's kingdom. Further on in the message, Jesus said, you're not listening. 
Let me say it again, unless a person submits to this original creation, the wind hovering over the water creations, the invisible moving the visible, a baptism into new life, it's not possible to enter God's kingdom. See all the ways that he wrote that? When you look at a baby, it's just that, a body you can look at and touch. But the person who takes shape within its with in is formed by something you can't see and touch, the spirit, and becomes a living spirit. Are we looking at things physically or are we looking at things spiritually? And then later in that passage, this is the crisis we're in. God light, God light streamed into the world, but men and women everywhere ran from the darkness. They went from the darkness because they were not really interested in pleasing God. Everyone who makes a practice of doing evil... Addic addicted to denial and illusion, hates God light and won't come near it. Fearing a painful exposure, but anyone work working and living in truth and reality welcomes God's light so the work can be seen for the God work it is. Is God working in your life? Is Jesus, pr is Jesus digging around? Are you pr being pruned where you need to be pruned? Or are you saying, no, 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 not me? Back to Luke 13. Then Jesus asked, What is the kingdom of God like? To what can I compare it to? Let me give you a comparison, a, a parable, a further teaching illustration that we've already been told the purpose of that. Either you will get your hearts hardened because you'll be forever hearing it and not understanding it, or you will hear and understand, even though your interpretation might not be exactly like mine because the Word of God is li living and breathe, breathing and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, and it cuts and divides soul and spirit to prepare the man of God. Don't forget that in, the, in that verse. What can I compare it? It is like a mustard seed that a man tossed into his garden. It grew and became a tree, and the birds of the air nested in its branches. Now, I've always been taught, and that's in Matthew and that's in Mark, I've always been taught that that mustard seed is a tiny little seed, and it grows up to the biggest of the ver garden variety plants. Whether you could call it a tree or not, mm, let's think about it. And then, this is, this is the kingdom of heaven, this is the church, and the birds come and find a place to nest and rest. But are we called to come and rest? We do find rest for our souls, but we're come to called to be part of the kingdom of God, to follow Him, to be fishers of men. Be careful when you talk about finding too much rest, or you become complacent and, and okay there. What was Jesus just talking about? Hypocrisy in the church. So I challenge you with that explanation that you've been taught and is taught frequently in the church today being one answer. <laughs> I'm going to give you a little different in a minute. Here's what Mark's gospel says, Mark 4, 26 to 29. Jesus also said the kingdom of God is like a man who scatters seed on the ground. Night and day he sleeps and wakes, and the seed sprouts and grows, though he knows not how. And all by itself the earth produces a crop, first the stalk, then the head, and then the grain that ripens within. Okay, that's, that seed that is planted was planted by God. It's a tiny little seed. It just takes a tiny little measure of faith. But we should pray that our faith is increased. We should be working out our salvation with fear and trembling, not just sitting in a tree and finding rest. Understand what I'm saying? It will grow up into a big thing, but not without persecution, not without denial, not without suffering, not without the cross not without following Jesus, not without feeding on Him, not without being empowered by the Spirit. Okay? There is, it goes on its own. It's something we don't know, just as he read from John, that the wind moves and we don't know where it comes from or anything else. But we see its effects. We see the fruit produced in our life. And as soon as the grain is ripe, He swings the sickle because the harvest has come. Oh, don't forget about that part. So I need to be living my life as though today could be my last day here on earth, doing what I need to do for the kingdom because I might not have tomorrow to be rich for God. I especially don't need to be focused on I, 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 or my life might be required tonight my foot with my foolish thinking. Okay? The farmer plants seeds so that it produces a crop 
And then harvest time is coming. Jesus came, the seed was planted. Jesus left. He said a harvest is coming. Be ready, waiting, dressed, working until that day comes. Not just sitting finding rest in the church because I'm saved and I know it. Okay? A tiny mustard seed grows into a big plant. It's something, well, if you call it a tree, it would be something that would even be supernatural because a mustard seed doesn't get that big. There are different varieties. Don't get me wrong. I did some research and studying on this. Some can grow 20 feet tall, but an average mustard seed in an average garden grows up to be two or three feet tall. Birds don't find rest in that. But with a supernatural working of the Spirit through you, uh-huh, that they see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven, it could grow into a tree, could it not? And the church did just that, even admit, uh, amidst suffering and persecution. Is the church growing that way in the United States now? No, it's in decline. Do we need some persecution and suffering? We need the power of the Holy Spirit guiding us even in times when it's not so that we are doing something, not just sitting, finding, and building a nest in the tree. So be careful how you talk about that. Then Jesus asked, What is the kingdom of like? What can I compare it to? Oh, let me excuse me, the next one. And again, he asked, So to what can I compare the kingdom of God? It is like leaven that a woman took and mixed into three measures of flour until it was all leavened. Most pre preach, again, that that parable, because it says the kingdom of God is like, but remember, parables are sometimes comparisons, sometimes contrasts, that say just like leaven, that the Holy Spirit, supernatural power, as long as we plant seeds, will grow and the church will expound and grow su su supernaturally to something big. Let me ask you a question. Are you planting seeds, first of all? Are you going out planting seeds? Are you telling people about the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news, that the year of the Lord's favor is upon you? If you are, if you are, because <laughs> most of us aren't taking that too seriously and planning it, then are you going back and working? Are you following up? Are your good deeds? Are you living a holy life set apart? Or do you just simply say, and here's the problem when you say just that, I planted the seeds. It's okay. Because if you take the parable that way, you better watch yourself saying that and you simply go out and plant the seed. You're a worker in the kingdom knowing a harvest is coming. You go along beside Jesus. The Holy Spirit has come alongside you. Let me remind you, Jesus just said a few verses ago, beware the leaven of the Pharisee. It'd be kind of confusing here if Jesus changed the leaven here to be positive versus negative as it was used a few, a few verses ago. If you go back to the Old Testament, leaven is always something that was forbidden because it went in and infiltrated. It wasn't allowed in sacrifices. It wasn't allowed in the festivals and everything. Did Jesus mean it as a positive here or did He mean it as a negative? Because He just had a confrontation in the church where the church leader said, Don't heal on the Sabbath. I reject this Jesus with Him being Lord of the Sabbath. So could these parables mean, like I said, don't throw rocks at me yet. Could these parables be a contrast? What is the kingdom of light? What can I compare it to? It's like mustard seed that a man tossed in his garden. Yes, the seed was planted. It grew into a big tree because this prosperity gospel was out there. And it grew and grew and grew. And people found plenty of, of places to build their nest, but it lacked the spirit, lacked the power. And the leaven went all throughout and the church grew and everything, but it had no spirit in it whatsoever. And it looked like it was the church, but it lacked the power. And we read in Scripture and other places that that, and that was coming in those days and is there now where it looks like something godly, but it's far from it. Beware of the leaven of the, hypoc of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. I can't tell you what the answer is there, and I don't mean to confuse you. I was simply taught all growing up that those two things talked about the church, the kingdom of God, in a positive manner. 
But as I read through Luke's gospel this time, I don't see it this way. Whether I see an alternative or not, I see it as a warning again. Because there was just confrontation in the church, and it's caused me to be very careful that I don't become complacent, and especially that I don't point fingers at something that I don't necessarily agree with. You can take it whichever way you want to, and as long as you apply it to your life and it impacts you and you're led by the Spirit. Where I have the trouble is that I'm figuring out the parable exactly right, but there's, you know, oh well. That's part of the dilemma of being a pastor again is that we preach the truth. As long as I preach to you in a way that the Holy Spirit speaks to you and you hear that and apply it to your lives, then I'm doing what I should be doing. Here's part of what I read, and I was like, yep, this is exactly what I was taught. Leaven is a symbol of the kingdom which will gradually and secretly permeate society. Just as a woman used the smallest bit of leaven in the dough, so the gospel starts with small beginnings. Just as the leaven quietly works its way through the whole batch, the gospel will have a profound impact on all sectors of society. See, I can't agree with that because the church was persecuted. It impacted society because they said, I can't believe this guy will not denounce Jesus Christ when I kill his children in front of his eyes. That he won't change. That he says, my allegiance is to Jesus. So I had to be very careful about not being active in the kingdom and focusing my eyes on Jesus and what Jesus did and what Jesus taught. And he tells me over and over again to be wary of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. As we read on, I think that, or at least I did, got a little bit more secure on Jesus was using those as contrasts. Verse 22, Then Jesus traveled throughout the towns and the villages, teachings as He made His way towards Jerusalem. Lord, someone asked Him, Will only a few be saved? Because if we look at it again with this mustard seed, all we got to do is plant, plant out there, and in no time, everyone will be the church. Well, here we are 2,000 years later, and that's far from the truth. We're back to what Scripture says, only a remnant will be saved. Those who have not blemished or tarnished or stained their clothing. Go back and read Jesus' letters in Revelation. Maybe it's just a coincidence that someone asked him that at this point. But Luke writes an orderly account. He put these parables right here where he put them. And even if you go back and read them in Matthew and read the one that's in Mark, you'll see that there was a compare and contrast there too. So then the very next word is make every effort to enter the narrow gate. Don't just sit there nested in the tree. You've got to make an effort. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You can't save yourself, but once you are saved, you're a worker in the kingdom. For many, I tell you, will try to enter and not be able. After the master of the house gets up and shuts the door, you will stand outside knocking and saying, Lord, open the door for us. But he will reply, I don't know where you're from. Then you will say, We ate and drank with you and taught in your streets and went to church and nested there in that mustard tree. I'll just throw that in there. And he will answer, I will tell you, I do not know where you are from. You are not part of the kingdom of God. You're not a citizen. You're not a child of God. Depart from me, all you evildoers. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all the prophets of the kingdom of God, but you yourselves are thrown out. Why did Luke put this right after those two parables and right after the confrontation in church unless he was giving these as a warning? <clears throat> People will come from the east and west and north and south. Yes, they'll come from all over. And they will recline at the table of the kingdom of God. And indeed, some who are last will be first and some who are first will be last. Jesus ends this section with... Realize that if you give up your life, you will save it. If you try to hold on to your life, you will lose it. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? Have you been born again? Are you empowered and lit by the Holy Spirit and working with others who aren't complacent, just nesting in the church, but instead are active living out the church, being the hands and feet of Jesus, having more compassion on human beings than you do animals, watching your hypocrisy, keeping it in check, and feeding yourselves with the bread of life and with the living water. The eleven had it wrong as far as kingdoms go when Jesus ascended into heaven. 
In Acts chapter 1 we read, So they came together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the what? Kingdom of Israel. They were still looking at physical things, not understanding the spiritual kingdom of heaven. Jesus replied, It's not for you to know times or seasons that the Father is fixed by His authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. They were confused about kingdoms, especially the kingdom of God. But what happened when Pentecost came and the Holy Spirit came in fire upon them? They were a changed people, a changed church. So what does the kingdom of God look like? For these closing reflections, I'm going to go back to the Sermon on the Mount and let you think about this meat that I'm giving you from the Word of God from Jesus' own mouth. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many enter it. But small is the gate and narrow the way that leads to life, and only a few find it. Beware of false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then, by their fruit you will recognize them, the good and the bad. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell, the torrents raised, and the wind blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because its foundation was on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them is like the foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the torments raged, and the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell, and great was its collapse. The seed of God has been planted. It is Jesus Christ, crucified for your sins, buried and raised again on the third day to bring you forgiveness of sins and eternal life. If you believe this, He is your Savior, and He has to be your Lord. Fruit will then be produced. And those who build their house upon the foundation of Jesus Christ will stand forever in the kingdom of God. Is this what you believe or not? Has Jesus set you captive free to serve Him and His kingdom for all eternity? Father in heaven, we thank you for Jesus' words. We thank you for Luke's gospel and the written word that we have in so many ways now that we can read it and study your word wherever we're at. We thank you that you have given us your spirit to seal us for that day, Lord, that we are your children, that the spirit intercedes for us when we don't even know what to pray with utterings we don't understand, and that Jesus is at your right hand interceding for us. Father, guide us into all truth, and Father, help us not to just seek truth without being doers of, the, of your word, Father. Help us to find compassion for, for a dying world out there that does not know you. Not to be complacent, not to be content in our salvation, but be ready working until Jesus Christ returns. To not be caught off guard, but to realize that there will be a harvest, and we are the workers that God has sent out in the field until that harvest day comes. We just thank you and praise you for the great salvation that has been given to us through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And in His name we pray this prayer. Amen.